You can be seated. <laughs> Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. Strategically encouraging. You'll find out in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Welcome to Stonebridge Church. My name is Keith Knight. I'm the student ministries pastor here. We just want to say welcome. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we are so happy that you've chosen to, to come hang out with us. And we would just like to ask something of you, if you wouldn't mind taking one of the cards from the seat back in front of you, filling it out, letting us know a little bit about yourself so that uh, we can get to know you a little bit better and perhaps even connect you with uh, one of the many ministries that we have here at Stonebridge. Also, this is the opportunity for you to fill out the card to put down any prayer requests that you might have because we want to join with you in uh, presenting your request to God. So if you have a prayer request and you'd like to fill out the back of that card, just let us know how we can be praying for you and with you. There are multiple times during the week when different groups here at Stonebridge pray over those requests. And it's always awesome when we can see a request come through and pray for it and then see how God answers those requests. It's amazing. So if you would, would join with us in that way, that would be amazing as well. Well, in just a minute, we're going to take the offering. So if our ushers would come forward, would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to come together and to celebrate how great you are, Lord, to sing of your majesty and, and how wonderful your name is. Lord, I ask that um, this morning that you would open up your word, help us to see uh, where we need to be changed. God, we pray for the group that has gone to Rosebud to do ministry there. We ask that you would bless them mightily this week as they do a backyard Bible club and work with the people there at Rosebud. And uh, Lord, we are uh, celebrating also the, the family camp registration, and, and uh, we are in anticipating a wonderful time with that this year. So Lord, we thank you for all the wonderful things that you're doing in and through our people here at Stonebridge. And Father, we ask that our joy would overflow into generosity and that we would be generous with our time, our talents, and our treasures. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, in case you didn't know, we have sent a team to, uh, to Rosebud, the Rosebud Reservation. They are doing work there, uh, a backyard Bible club, much in the same format that we did backyard Bible clubs in, in the Cedar Rapids vicinity. And uh, so we are praying for them, and we are celebrating with them as they do that this week. It's a family missions trip, which means that there are children involved, and it always does my heart good to see young people and children learning mission when they're young. And uh, in, our, in our prayer this morning, I did mention family camp. We've actually had 130 sign-ups for family camp already, and this is only really the second week that we've done it. So that is amazing, and we are anticipating a really great time. We've got a lot of people who are new to the church or new to family camp signed up this year, so we celebrate that. If you've never experienced a family camp before, I would highly encourage you to to sign up and participate. You don't have to be a family if you're a single. You can come to family camp because we as a church are a family, a family of brothers and sisters in Christ, right? So we would encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity that you have to enter into fellowship with us in family camp, to learn and to take your next step with Jesus. I mentioned uh, that the worship this morning I think was a little bit strategic. The reason it's because I mentioned last week that uh, our sermon titles have been uh, pretty interesting as we've gone through the Minor Prophets. A couple weeks ago we had polluted worship. Last week was rebuked. This week is unfaithfulness. So again, uh, people are driving by. I'm sure they're like, that's where the party is. So this morning, this morning was strategically uh, boisterous, I think, to, to, to get our hearts excited for God. But let's not, let's not lose sight of what's really going on here in Malachi. Just because a passage of Scripture might be a little bit tough for us to digest, because it might be a little bit challenging for us, doesn't mean that it's, it's harmful, doesn't mean that it's worthless, that we just throw it out. Most times when we go to the Old Testament, uh, we go with many, many, many questions. Because there are certain things in the Old Testament that are really hard to understand at first glance. If we don't understand the whole arc of Scripture and how God is working from Genesis to Revelation, there are a lot of things that we can miss. And if we don't understand how the gospel informs all of Scripture, there are a lot of things that we can miss. And we can sort of get bogged down in these texts 
that might look really discouraging at first sight. So when we say today we're going to talk about unfaithfulness, you might be like, oh, man. And yes, there will be times this morning where the text will be challenging for some more than others. But I would ask you this morning to have an open heart and an open mind as we come to the Word and to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. So if you'll join me in Malachi chapter 2, we're going to start in verses 10. We're going to go verses 10 through 16. <clears throat> have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Let's pray. Father God, we um, come this morning with anticipation that you're going to speak to us through your word, that you're going to show us what it is that you really mean in these verses and how that fits into our understanding of your character, how it fits into our understanding of our own character, and how it fits into our understanding of how Jesus Christ has died so that we could be made new and put in a right relationship with you. So Lord, as we come, we come humbly begging that you would help us understand uh, where we might have confusion, and Lord, that we would leave with clarity of mind and openness of heart. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So unfaithful, we continue in this uplifting series this week. We've examined how the Israelites under Persian rule at this point in time uh, were sort of disillusioned and confused. They were had, had been living, they had been under so many different regimes and, and experienced so many different types of oppression that at this point they were just sort of tired, confused, disillusioned. They were among a group of people with the Persians who had ruled over them and yet not said, you're not uh, able to worship. What they had said was, you know, you, you worship as you want, but yet they were in the middle of this pagan culture that was very permissive of many things. So the Israelites weren't just worshiping with all their hearts. They were sort of half-heartedly worshiping God and at the same time trying to live in the, the world of the cultures that surrounded them. They were very, very confused. And instead of displaying God's greatness, they had become lazy and careless in their worship. And it almost treated God as one of many gods instead of the one true God. This is where we find the Israelites in the book of Malachi. So God speaking through the prophet Malachi, is, he's not just calling out the Israelites, but he is calling them to repent. In Malachi chapter 4, when we get to chapter 4, we'll see a verse that says, return to me and I will return to you. God's not just saying, you guys stink. God is saying, come back to me. And his call to the Israelites throughout the Old Testament was always come back to me, repent and return. And so this week we're going to be diving into something that can be a bit of a sensitive subject. And I know that when, you, when we come to this text, just verses 10 through 16, there are so many things that are so confusing. And even if you were to look at the background of historically of the the criticisms of the text and dive a little bit more into certain verses. It, there are certain words that are confusing. There are certain phrases that are confusing and certain ideas that are confusing. But this morning we're going to jump right into it and see if we can't make some sense of it. God begins 
In this passage of Scripture, we've looked at him talking to the priests, and he starts off verse 10 by saying, Have we not all one Father? His first criticism of the Israelites was their unfaithfulness to the Father. Their unfaithfulness to the Father. He says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? We looked at this a little bit last week, the idea of the covenant, specifically the covenant of Levi. But we're going to jump a little bit more into this idea of covenant. And when God refers back to the covenant in judging his people, what is he trying to convey? What message is he trying to help us understand? So let's look a little bit at the covenant and, and how he might be speaking of the covenant in this passage of Scripture. Everyone turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. We'll actually pick up 6 through 10 as well. So Deuteronomy chapter 7. <clears throat> when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than yourselves. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. And verses 3 and 4 is where we're going to sort of camp out in this part of the covenant. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram and burn their carved images with fire. Parts of the Old Testament are very hard for us to handle because God says things like devote them to complete destruction. And immediately we're like, well, how can be God be loving and then say devote them to complete destruction? But don't miss the forest for the trees here. The whole point of this passage of Scripture, when God says you shall devote them to complete destruction and show no mercy, is all about the purity of their worship for, and, and their understanding of God's holiness, right? When he says you shall not intermarry, giving your daughters to their sons, they would turn away your sons from following me. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you. And he says, you shall deal with them this way. Knock down all their items of worship. Clear them out of the space that I am giving you so that you will not be polluted. And when we look into Malachi, this is where we find them at. Part of this covenant God made with Israel involved the protection of their separation from the people groups around them who practiced the worship of false gods, part of which was child sacrifice. So in case you're tempted to think, well, God's so mean, he just had them kill all these people. A lot of these people were people who would take babies and set them on these giant stone altars that were, had a fireplace in the belly, and they would heat these bellies up and let their children burn on the hands of these gods. So when you see a God who says, clear these people out, we can maybe understand a little bit more. These were not just innocent people that were playing marbles in the yard, and the Israelites come and clear them out. This is a lot more serious. God is interested in the purity of his people. So part of this covenant is the separation of, of God's people. And in 6 through 10, Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 10, he says, You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all of the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people, because the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. So in Malachi so far, we've seen some of the ways in which Israel was polluting the covenant worship practices that had been handed down to them by God. They were bringing worthless sacrifices. They were speaking blessings to each other without God's blessing. The priests were, were saying, hey, you are blessed, but God wasn't blessing these sacrifices. They were complaining to God about how he was letting them down. Oh, really? How have you loved us? We don't feel the love. 
And in the middle of all these things, there was one other major thing that was being done that displayed the Israelites' unfaithfulness to God and to his covenant. And this is what's being addressed in 10 through 16. See, what they were doing was they were divorcing the Israelite wives that they had taken at youth. In, in the Israelite culture, in cultures in the, in the, in the East at this point in time uh, in history, they would have been taking wives. I mean, people were getting married at like 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, right? They, they were, it, there was no like teenage years, right? There's like, oh, it's time to play video games and hang out. I mean, there was like time to get married and be a man or be a woman. This was part of the culture. So they were marrying young, marrying other Israelites young. And what had happened is as they had gotten older and they were in this Persian culture, they were divorcing the Israelite uh, spouses that they had taken at a young age in order to marry or sort of swap in for Persian or neighboring culture women, women who uh, were foreigners, who worshiped different gods. This is what the Israelites we're doing. And the Israelite leaders were leading the way in this practice. And if you read Ezra, the book of Ezra, you'll see this problem was severe. Malachi is a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah. So this problem of the divorcing Israelite wives and intermarrying with foreign women was a big, big problem. And it was a big problem for God. You know, God says in Malachi 2.10, have we not all one father? Has not One God created us. Why are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? And in Malachi 2.11, he says, Judah has been faithless. An abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has, check this passage, this little phrase out, married the daughter of a foreign God. When we look at this passage of Scripture, this is one of the things to keep in mind. Why was God so mad and so focused on unfaithfulness? Because they were marrying the daughters of a foreign god. They were uniting themselves to people who did not know the Lord and did not worship the Lord, and they were doing it at the cost of God's people. So in essence, Israel had committed two major acts of unfaithfulness. Two major acts of unfaithfulness. The first is unfaithfulness to the covenant calling of separation from pagan cultures. And the second is unfaithfulness to their covenant marriages with God's people. And I'm emphasizing with God's people. What was the big deal about the unfaithfulness to the covenant marriages with God's people? Now let me make it very clear here that the New Testament upholds this same principle that Malachi is explaining here. That it is not right for God's people to unite themselves intimately with someone who does not worship God. It's not right for God's new covenant people to unite themselves with someone who is not a new covenant person. It's something that I've seen in youth ministry for years, right? Missionary dating. Uh, this, This girl is so cute. Is she a believer? Ah, I don't know, but I'm gonna date her. Because if I date her, then I'll bring her to the Lord. That's how that always works, right? No, it doesn't at all. It doesn't at all. And more times than not, I've seen somebody try to missionary date. Oh, this boy's so cute. I'm going to make him a Christian. And it never works. Right? Very rarely does that work. Because God has set forth a principle, and the same principle that he set forth to the Israelites here. Folks, when you unite yourself intimately with someone who does not worship God, it's going, to be, it's going to be much easier for you to be pulled over to their thought process, to their uh, ideals, than it is for you to pull them to your ideals, right? Because the Holy Spirit has to be doing that work there. It's not you. It's the Holy Spirit's work in their hearts. So we are told here in Malachi that part of the issue was entering into relationships basically with unbelievers. This is what the Israelites were doing, and they were sort of polluting the nation by doing this. Uh, In Malachi 2.11, remember, he says that you have married the daughters of a foreign god. You have married yourself to the daughter of a foreign god. Now, part of what else is going on here is it's not like the Israelites don't realize that some of this stuff is against God's law. It's not like they're completely in the dark. And so some of them were sort of getting emotional about it. Look at verses 13 and 14. 
The second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you've been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. See, emotion alone doesn't fix the problem. It's not just about going and crying at the altar. It's not about living the way you want to during the week and then showing up at the figurative altar on Sunday mornings and saying, okay, now Sunday is my repentance time or this day is my repentance time. And as long as I come to God and weep and wail and mourn and ask, then, then that's going to change everything. And God was actually saying, this is part of the issue is you're acting like you're sorry, but you're only sorry because of the consequences. You, don't still, you still don't understand what the problem is. And so God then explains to them what the problem is so they, they will understand. This is where the Lord begins to explain to them that faithfulness to Him shows itself in the way that we treat other people. And especially, especially in the way that we treat people who are in the family of God. And this is where the text begins to get a little bit harder and God gets into the problem with unfaithfulness, marital unfaithfulness and divorce. So we're going to get into this today. We're going to enter into this problem that God lines out for us. Number one, God says this, that it breaks the contract of marriage. Look at verse 14. You say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. See, the Lord stands as a witness to this covenant relationship was initiated in Adam and Eve, right? For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and will cleave to his wife and the two shall become one, right? That's the Genesis ideal covenant of a man and a woman. And God says, I stand witness to this covenant. Now, God is neither male nor female, right? God's not a man. And God's not a woman, Okay, I'm going to break some of your hearts today. God is not a white man. Okay, I know that some of you are really astounded by that. But it's, it's true. Okay, God, and God is not a, a male in the sense that we would classically think of a man. But God is also not a woman. Right? We don't have a mother God. But in God, in, in this image bearing, what we see is that in creating male and female, he has given each of them characteristics that display different parts of his own character. So when he unites a male and a female together in a relationship, the complementary nature of that relationship has an amazing opportunity to show off or display a, a more comprehensive idea of God's image. Does that make sense? And that's why, when, why you, some might ask, why do Christians get so crazy about this whole thing of marriage? Is because when I look at marriage, it's not just about some two people decide, hey, let's get together and have fun. It is a total picture of God's nature and his character displayed in the complementary relationship of a man and a woman united with God as witness. Marriage is uniting of a male and a female in a representative relationship of God's image between these complementary individuals with one man and one woman. And to break off this contract is to do damage to the image of God in the other person who has entered in. So when God says, this thing that you do in breaking this covenant and breaking this contract, you're faithless because you're doing damage to somebody else who is part of my family. You're letting go these Israelite wives in order to take for yourself a foreign wife and you don't understand the damage that you're doing when you're doing this. So that's the first issue. The second issue is it causes pain and suffering for the offspring or through the offspring. Look at verse 15. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? What does it say the one God was seeking? Help me out. Godly offspring right? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. All throughout scripture, one of the commands for the Israelites, ever since Adam and Eve, God puts Adam and Eve in the garden, unites them and says what? Be fruitful and multiply, right? Make babies. And to the Israelites, he says, hey, I'm cool with you making babies. One of the amazing things about the Israelites, the Egyptians put the Israelites under their thumb because they were reproducing at such a rate. They were like rabbits. I mean, they were just like, 
reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. And the Egyptians were like, this is getting out of hand. They're going to outnumber us. So they put them in slavery because they were outnumbering them. But they had it right. God wanted them to procreate. Even though they were a small nation with small beginnings, there was a, an importance that Israel would go on in the, as a nation as Israelites gave birth to these children. And the parents were commanded to raise their children to walk in God's ways. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, right? What does God desire from these marital relationships with the Israelites? He wanted them to continue the nation. The nation must continue, right? Israel, there will always a remnant will remain. There will always be this group of people, no matter how small they are, right? And, and this is carried on through, through generations, through children. These parents were commanded to raise them to walk in God's ways. Now, the breaking of this covenant that God is talking about in 10 through 16 was damaging for Israel in a couple ways. Any children born from that broken marriage would be hurt by the breaking of the marriage. And any children born from a union with foreign religious culture would be pulled away from full devotion to God. How do I know this? Is there anybody in Israelite history who dabbled with foreign women, created a child who was not fully devoted to God, and it caused problems for the Israelites through history? Can anybody think of that man? His name was Abraham. And because he wasn't patient and united himself with Hagar and gave birth to Ishmael, he set before the Israelites forever contention between Israel and the Arabic people. Right? This, this, is, a, this is the problem that we see bearing itself out in Scripture, that any children born from this union would be pulled away from full devotion to God. And though there are many opportunities for children of broken marriages and divorces to thrive and to find joy and peace in Christ, it is universally understood that they will struggle on some level with parental disconnections of this nature. Now, this is tough for us. And I will admit to you, some of, some of you know my own personal story and some of you don't. I am divorced and I have three children. And I can attest to this, right? That it doesn't matter how smooth things go or how devoted you are to the Lord or how much you see God moving. On some level, children are going to struggle when there's a breaking of the covenant. The third thing is when divorce happens outside of God's standards, the effects linger. Look at verse 16. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? Covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. And one of the things that we will see when, when studies are done, and one of the things that was blatantly apparent in Israel, was when you look through the Old Testament and see how many wives some of these jokers had, the idea of fidelity and faithfulness was insane, right? I mean, wives and concubines and multiplying wives, which is the very thing. Don't be fooled and think that God was cool with this. It was the very thing God said not to do. Don't multiply wives. Don't multiply horses. Don't multiply chariots, right? Don't do these things. And yet the kings were leading the way. The leaders led the way in this. But what God is saying here is, is it's largely true that marriages following these divorces or putting away would end the same way. And statistically, if you would look at a lot of divorces, even in America, a lot of times uh, when someone is divorced, especially for the wrong reasons and remarries, there's a lot of problems in that second marriage. But I would attribute these instances to the same problem that Israelites were having. These situations in which there were snap decisions avoiding godly counsel, and the motivation was more about selfishness and what can I get out of these relationships. See, these priests were putting away wives for no good reason, and they were writing them certificates of divorce because of the hardness of their hearts, is what Jesus Christ says in the New Testament, because out of the hardness of their hearts, they would write a certificate of divorce. And let me give you a little, just a little nugget of information. The certificate of divorce wasn't so much for the man as it was for the woman. Because when a man wrote the woman a certificate of divorce and divorced her, and she remarried, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, I believe it is. I think it's Deuteronomy 24, maybe Exodus 24. Look it up. Uh, in the Old Testament, God says that once that happens, that means that a man can't write a woman a certificate of divorce, get remarried, and then decide later, you know what, I really kind of like that first wife, so I'm gonna go back and, and mess around with her. I'm gonna take her back. God says you can't do that. There's no, no going back at, after that point. It was to protect the women from a husband who was just going to like put them away and then take them and put them away and then take them and put them away and then take them. It was more for their protection because of the hardness of the men's hearts. 
But what God is really trying to get us to see here is that unfaithfulness leaves a trail of hurt and pain in its wake. You know, when you, when, instead of just looking at this text, let's sort of interject ourselves into how these Israelite wives and children might have felt when the priests who were doing this, because it does say that you cover the altar with tears, but who, was, who, was the only, who were the only people that had access to the altar? The priests. They were the ones who were doing this. You know, he's trying to get the priests to understand the damage that this is causing because when they're faithless with one another, it displays their faithlessness to God. Because loving God means loving and serving one another. But let me mention this, because I think it's really important in any passage of Scripture that we look at that's, that regards divorce and unfaithfulness, it's really important for us to understand something. That it is not always the same. This passage of Scripture in Malachi is talking about a very specific instance that is more about national uh, spiritual purity and the practices that they were engaging in, but is not always the same. The instances in this passage dealing with divorce are not a blanket statement that we can universally apply to every situation. There are cases in Scripture in which God actually divorces Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 8, he issues Israel a certificate of divorce. God says, I am divorcing you because of your unfaithfulness. And there are cases in which God commands the Israelites to divorce pagan foreign wives and put away the wives and the children in Ezra. And that's really hard for us to understand. But God has a plan in these things. It's not always the same. Jesus himself lays out the standard that unfaithfulness or marital infidelity is a breaking of the one flesh covenant. That, that unfaithfulness, cheating, that itself is a breaking of the covenant and a divorce because of the, the breaking of the one flesh union. It's legitimate grounds for divorce. But because human beings tend to run to extremes on this issue, most times you're either going to find an extreme legalism about this issue or you're going to find an extreme permissiveness about this issue. And it's a real hot button issue that gets us all fired up, especially if, like me, you've experienced either unfaithfulness, divorce, or both. You don't think it was hard for me to prepare this sermon this week. <laughs> Jay Adams, who's a Christian, he's a theologian and a counselor. He uh, wrote an awesome book on uh, divorce and remarriage, uh, uh, infidelity, marriage, divorce, remarriage, and Christianity. It's a very short book, but it's just amazing in the way that he handles the texts. And he, I'm going to use a couple quotes from him. He says, It is altogether true that God hates divorce. But he neither hates all divorces in the same way, nor hates every aspect of divorce. He hates what occasions every divorce, even the one that he gave to sinful Israel. He hates the results that often flow to children and to injured parties of a divorce. Yet even that did not stop him from willing divorce in Ezra 10.44. And he hates divorces wrongly obtained on grounds that he has not sanctioned. The unfaithfulness that plagued Israel that is being addressed in Malachi has its root in a people who were dissatisfied with a God they didn't believe was showing them love. What was the first question the Israelites ask of God in Malachi? How have you loved us? See, the problem of unfaithfulness and faithlessness for Israel found its root in them being un unfaithful to God because they, they didn't really believe that God loved them. They weren't satisfied with God's love. It wasn't about being satisfied as much with each other's love as it was with their satisfaction with God's love. And this dissatisfaction with God led them down a path of faithlessness both to the covenant-making God and to their covenant spouses and people. And this brings up something we can take away from this passage of Scripture. So here's our takeaway for today. Being satisfied with God's love produces faithfulness. Being satisfied with God's love produces faithfulness. The main issue with all the Israelite problems had their root in dissatisfaction with God. And God's call to them in Malachi 4 is, return to me and I will return to you. But God issues a warning twice at the end of this passage that we all need to pay attention to. All of us. You may think, well, I've never been through a divorce. I've never been through unfaithfulness. Listen, there are a lot of ways in which people can be unfaithful. The actual word for adultery that Jesus uses when he says in this case divorce is permissible is porneia, which is where we get our idea of pornography from. So for any of you men, women who might think, oh, this really isn't this bad, viewing pornography is unfaithfulness in the same degree that committing adultery is unfaithfulness. So let me just lay that out. 
And God takes that just as seriously. God says to us, guard your spirit against faithlessness. I'm not sure somebody just wakes up one day out of the blue and decides, man, this is a really good day to be unfaithful. I don't think that happens. I think it is a, 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 pro, a, a progression over time of somebody growing cold in their love for God and then in their love for other people. Because if you don't love God right, you're not going to love others right. And if you're not loving others right, then it shows the root of you not loving God right. The solution was really quite simple. Loving God with all of your heart faithfully changes every relationship. So if you're here today and you're struggling in your marriage, your answer is not to stop stepping on each other's love hose or to throw more points in the love bank or whatever the heck people say now is... I don't even, I can't even, it's not about, oh, this is not their language or what. I don't care about languages, okay? God says, if you love me faithfully and devote yourself to me faithfully, your relationships will be changed. If you're struggling in your marriage, love God faithfully. If you're struggling with unfaithfulness or divorce, love God faithfully. If you're engaged to be married and you're impatient, you can't wait, wait and love God faithfully. And if you've been called to be single, be joyful and love God faithfully. As I said last week, the entirety of God's covenant with Israel was to put his holiness on display. The entirety of the covenant, that, the new covenant that we experience in Jesus Christ, there's one point. To put Jesus on display. It's not about just what we can get out of it. It's not about Jesus just making our lives so much better and we'll never have any problems. It's about displaying his beauty. Israel needed to see themselves as God's representatives in in a place that they weren't home. And as I said last week, this is not our home. And the whole call for us as God's covenant people is to live in a way that we know that we have a home eternal that is unpolluted and all these things, unfaithfulness, divorce, sadness, sorrow, brokenness, will no longer exist, and God will personally wipe away every tear. But until then, we view our relationships as having eternal significance. And when we do that, we have our eyes open to the abiding faithfulness of God through Jesus Christ. The faithful one can do amazing things even when we are unfaithful. Let me show you a couple of beautiful things. Jeremiah 3.12 God says, return faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. That that in and of itself is good news. In Jeremiah 3.22, he says again, return, O faithless sons. I will heal your faithlessness. If you struggle with faithfulness, God says, I can heal that. Even in our unfaithfulness, God turns his anger. God turns his anger from those whom he loves. No matter the faithlessness, God can bring amazing healing and redemption in so many crazy ways. We could look at this passage and be like, see, God hates divorce. So everybody who's divorced is messed up and it's all messed up and never, nothing's ever going to be anything good, right? Everything's just polluted and it's bad and it's wrong and there's only going to be sorrow. But I want to show you something. Jay Adams again says about the marriage of David and Bathsheba. Clearly, God allowed the marriage of David and Bathsheba to stand even though both of them had been guilty of adultery and David of murder as well. No more sordid beginning to a marriage could be imagined. Have you ever heard anything like that? I haven't. Yet God blessed that marriage in time because forgiveness was granted, the past was cleansed, and the future was cleared for God's blessing. If this marriage which at its inception was knee-deep in sin, could be blessed by God to the bringing forth of the Messiah, why do we say that persons who are forgiven and cleansed before marrying cannot expect God to bless their marriage because of sin in the past? I think that's amazing. And it's something that we need to think about. That Jesus Christ, his flesh, was in history a product of one of the worst beginnings of a relationship that we could ever see. And what is God showing us through this? You know, there's some of us here who have 
experienced unfaithfulness, who have experienced marital strife and divorce. And God has the same position towards these things that he has held from the beginning. Unfaithfulness is sin. Sin can be forgiven. Forgiveness paves the way for restoration. And everyone, everyone, everyone has access to this restoration through Jesus. Did I say everyone? If you are struggling in your faithfulness to God or to others, listen to God's word today. Guard yourselves in your spirit against faithlessness. Don't just weep and wail and wonder why God won't answer. Repent of your unfaithfulness. Accept the gift of forgiveness through the cross and pursue restoration of relationship with God and with others. God is trying to get the Israelites to see their faithlessness and their sin, but he's always trying to call them back, and he's always trying to call us back. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. I'm going to leave you with this verse today. It says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is that good news? Yes. It's good news for me. <laughs> if we confess our sins, he is faithful. Even if we are faithless, he is faithful. It's amazing. And it's the gospel. If you're here today and you've never entered into this covenant relationship with Jesus Christ where you've put your faith and trust in him and trusted in his faithfulness to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, I would invite you to do that today. It is the best thing that could ever happen. Because you know what the truth is about God because of his faithfulness? It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how bad you mess up. He will never put you away. He will never write you a certificate of divorce. The God who saves you keeps you. And he is faithful to complete the good work that he begins in us. It's good news. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we can be together and experience your word fresh and new and Lord, it is so, so encouraging, as discouraging as it is to read this passage and how bad the Israelites are screwing up and then to be reminded of our own sin. It is so much more encouraging, Lord, to see the way in which you work your faithfulness. God, we are so thankful for your truth, your word that opens up our hearts and shows us who we are and who you are. And I pray that we would receive it with gladness and humility today. Lord, that you would change our hearts if there's anyone here today that has never repented and believes for the first time, Lord, may this be the day that they see your faithfulness and their heart is open. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Keith. You know, as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper, one of the reasons this is so meaningful is because it reminds us that God is faithful. Even when we are faithless, God is always faithful. And what we see on this table is a visual reminder, not only of God's faithfulness, but what God has done to reconcile all of us to him. It's amazing. And as we celebrate today, we can understand his faithfulness and his love for us. And to help us to understand that, I'd like to read a portion of scripture from Ephesians chapter 2 that shows all that God has done so that we can be restored and reconciled with God. As for you, you were dead in your transgression and sins, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgression. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Because of Jesus sacrificing his body, because of Jesus shedding his blood, we can be reconciled with God. And just like he said, everyone, everyone has access to restoration 
and reconciliation with God. That is good news. And what we see on this table is a reminder of that good news. You know, the Bible tells us on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he was with his disciples, and they were celebrating the Passover meal. And the Bible tells us that during the meal, Jesus took the bread, and he gave thanks. Then he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after the meal was over, Jesus took the cup. And again, he gave thanks for the cup. Then he gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you. This cup represents the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus was letting his disciples know that he was taking the place of the Passover lamb. If you are a guest this morning, we want you to know that you do not need to be a member at Stonebridge to participate. But the Bible is very clear that before we participate in receiving the bread and the cup, we're to examine our hearts. And only those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus as the one who paid the penalty for their sin are to participate. So as the elders come forward, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we prepare to receive the bread, which represents your body and the cup, which represents your blood, we don't want to end, underestimate our own faithlessness. But even more importantly, we don't want to underestimate your faithfulness. And we're grateful, so grateful, that your faithfulness is much bigger than our biggest failures. As we continue in prayer, if you're here this morning and you have never crossed over the bridge of separation from God to reconciliation with God, today that can change. When you receive the bread and the cup, in the quietness of your own heart, ask God to give the salvation he offers Come humbly to him and turn away from whatever it is that you're trusting in. Step out in faith. Receive his forgiveness. Father, we thank you that you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. As the bread is being distributed, there'll be a time of silence so that you can reflect on God's faithfulness in all that he has done for you. Scripture tells us that God demonstrates his love for each one of us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Take and eat. Roger, would you ask God's blessing on the cup, please? Lord God, let us um, all be reconciled to you and recommit ourselves to you. In your holy name I pray. Amen.
It wasn't gold, it wasn't silver that paid the price for the penalty for our sin, but it was the precious blood of Jesus. Take and drink. Thank you for joining us in worshiping our faithful God. And as you leave, remember that verse that Keith shared out of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is good news. Well, as you leave, we have a guideline here at Stonebridge. Take the first three minutes. Go out of your way to find someone you don't know and introduce yourself and just say, we're glad that you came. Also, if you haven't signed up for family camp, truck right into the lobby, go to the registration table, sign up or ask any questions that you might have. Now may the Lord bless you with his steadfast love, which is new every morning. Why? Because his faithfulness is so great. Amen. You're dismissed.